Hi, I'm Adam Summer. You're listening to the Yershami Talk podcast with the support of the Yeshivat Devar Yushalayim in Harnof, Jerusalem. This is Shvius, Chapter 1, Halacha 3. Now, in the last Mishnah, we were talking about, in order to qualify an area of the Betzeh as a field of trees, the trees must produce a block of pressed figs that weighs 60 Italian manna. And the following mission is going to teach how to determine about other species of trees besides a fig tree and whether that's going to comprise a field of trees. So the mission starts off and says, whether in the case of a non-fruit tree or in the case of a fruit tree other than a fig tree, which was, by the way, covered in Halakha 2, the following guideline applies. It says, We view them as though they were fig trees. And we say that if they would be able to yield a block of pressed figs with the weight of 60 Italian manna, one may plow the entire Betsea on their account. And if they would yield less than that amount, one may not plow for them any more than their need. In other words, that you're allowed to plow underneath the canopy, plus that two amo area around the tree where a picker could theoretically go. Now, why can't you plow the entire Betsea? Well, the reason why is it doesn't yield enough to count as a field of trees. And because it doesn't count enough, you, you are limited. It puts you into the category of a field of grain, a white field. And that means that you can plow up to the last day of Pesach, but the field of trees, you can plow up to Shavuot. So what would the case of a non-fruit tree be? Well, non-fruit trees would be planted for their lumber. And what happens is if you're, if you're plowing the field to get the water into the ground around the root system, it's going to thicken the trunk and produce better quality building wood and beams. So if somebody would be plowing after Shavuot for um, you know, trees that would be used for uh, beams of wood, um, you know, that would, you know, that would certainly damage the tree. And so somebody who is planting after Shavuot, it would be seen that they're preparing the ground. Uh, for other plants that would grow on Shvius, and you're not allowed to do that. Okay, um, so when this when this was in, you know, okay. So then, in the case of a fruit tree other than a fig tree, that would be like if you had olive trees, and if you had olive trees, you would say, okay, how much yield do we have? Does it come out to, um, you know, like if you had a you know block of figs with a weight of sixty Italian matta? Am I coming out with a yield of uh, olives that comes out to a weight of 60 Italian manna? And if you are, then you're allowed to plow the entire Betsea on their account. And uh, again, uh, we're talking about uh, the individual trees. So if you have three individual uh, trees, each of the three has to produce this. And if it produces less, if two of them produce this amount and one produces less, Again, you are in the category of a white field. That's a field of grain, and you're limited up until plowing until the last day of Pesach. So um, the idea is that, you know, if if it is a field of trees, you're allowed to plow the entire Betse on their account. That means that, uh, you know, even if it's a different kind of tree, the real question is whether the yield is going to require, you know, hit this minimum. Now. Why is it that the fig tree is going to be chosen as the standard? And we're going to be covering that in this Gemara. Um, some authorities maintain that the three trees combined must produce the 60 mana block of figs. That's going to be the Ravad says that. But uh, there are a lot of others, including the Rosh, who hold that it's each tree uh, that has to produce this amount. Uh, so... Uh, that's that's um, a question 
you know, the that's a that's a that's a question, that's a debate whether the three of them have to produce this or it's each one. Um, I personally read it like uh, the Rosh, where it's uh, each one. But I think that uh, also it makes a lot of sense where you're talking about um, the three trees together need to produce this. So anyway, uh, what is going to be the Hala Hala Misa? You have to check with with what the Chazanish wrote. Um, the Chazanish for the laws of the land on this is going to be what the Hala Hala Misa will be. So anyway, the Mishnah now teaches that if or how much each one of the three trees must produce and it says if one tree produces a 60 mana block of dried figs and two do not produce it or if two produce a 60 mana block of dried figs and one does not produce it one may not plow for them any more than their need until there are three that produce the required amount so according to this uh this this is being um, interpreted like what the Ravad would say and according to how the Ravad would say it it would be that the field's total yield must be 60 mana and each of the three trees has to produce a third of that amount which would be 20 mana and the Mishnah's first case is where a tree one tree produces the entire 60 mana but the other two uh, uh, make less than that uh, third uh, and the second case is where the two trees produce 60 mana and combined or each one separately where the, the, the third tree would yield less than a third. But in both cases, the trees fail to perform a field of trees and you may not, you're not allowed to plow the Betsaya after Pesach. Now, if we wanted to do this according to the Rosh's interpretation, here's how it would look. It would say that each tree on its own must produce this amount. And in this view, the Mishnah means that if only one tree yields 60 mana, while the others produce less than amount, or even if two of the trees yield 60 and one produces less, then after Pesach, one may plow only the immediate vicinity underneath the tree, and you're not allowed to plow the entire Betsaya. So that's two ways of uh, interpreting this. And in both cases, the result is the same. You're not allowed to um, you're not allowed to uh, plow the whole thing. Anyway, uh, the the law applies when uh, there are between three and nine trees. This is going to be uh, what the Mishnah says, and that means that if there's four trees. Uh, each must produce a quarter of the 60 mana, that would be 15. And if there would be five trees, they have to produce a fifth. And this is what uh, the Ravad would be uh, saying it as. In other words, by the Ravad, he's saying that the total is going to be 60. So if you have four, uh, you have to each tree has to produce a quarter of it. Now, the Rosh uh, wouldn't, wouldn't hold it like that. The Rosh would hold that each tree on its own has to produce 60 mana of the dried figs. So the Mishnah here uh, is basically going to be the same whether there's going to be three or nine, and that even if there's nine, each one has to produce 60 mana. And if one of them should fail to yield this, the Betsaya, uh, except for the vicinity of the trees, may not be plowed after Pesach. That's the idea of the Rosh. So um, the it's going to be problematic if if it's going to be like the Rosh to try to plant more than four more than three trees because if you have four trees in a Betsaya and three of them produce 60 mana and one does not, then you're not allowed to plow the entire field. And so um, why why would that be? Well uh, you might have it where you have just, you know, one unproductive tree. And now what happens is, uh, you know, you have all your trees not fully utilizing uh, the root system nourishment. And so they're, they're, they're kind of, there's a lot of overlap there. And so it's possible that you're going to have, you know, an underperforming tree or two. 
So that would be the problem with doing more than that, according to the Rosh. The mission is going to continue. It's going to say, however, if there are 10 trees or more than 10 trees, whether they produce or whether they do not produce, one may plow the entire Betsaya on their account. So that's an incentive to plant it where you're fully utilizing the nourishment, even though there's a little bit of overlap. Um, I believe that the root system in this square configuration of uh, five by five, two rows of five by five, would have it where the roots go up to 15.8 amot, away from the trunk of the tree, on each of these 10 trees. And yes, you're losing out on about you know, half an amot uh, of, of potential nourishment on each of these uh, trees in each direction, but you're still getting the most. But you get this benefit in the halaha that whether they're going to produce or whether they're not going to produce, you can plow the entire betseya. Why would you have more than 10 trees here? Why does the Mishnah talk about more than 10 trees? Well, that's going to be in case you're trying to grow trees for firewood. And if you're going to try to grow trees for firewood, uh, then you're trying to grow, you know, as much lumber as possible because you're going to burn it. And you're not growing it for the fruit. You're growing it to get the most out of the lumber and plowing it. It's going to get water into it, into the ground, and it's going to be better quality lumber. Now, the mission is going to talk about this earlier clause that was stated that if there are fewer than three productive trees, one may not plow them until Shavuot more than their need. And the mission now is going to give a scriptural derivation to explain why the entire Betsaya may not be plowed. In other words, where do we know this from? Where does this come from? And, you know, the you know, there's several passages in the Bobli. Uh, like in Rosh Hashanah 9a or in Makot 8b, and um, it's evident that the scriptural interpretation that's going to come is from Rabbi Akiva. There's a there's a disagreement between Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Yishmael on on this. Rabbi Akiva holds that uh, we know this from the scripture and its deraita, and Rabbi Yishmael holds that uh, the halacha is the same. But we don't know it from the scripture. We know it from a halahala Moshe Lissinai. That's the disagreement. Okay, they both agree on the halaha. Okay, but but how they're deriving it is different. So the first one that's going to come up is going to be the opinion of Rabbi Akiva. And by the way, just FYI, um, we hold that uh, it's going to be a halahala Moshe Lissinai. Anyway, so. This is stated, so how do we know this? How do we know that you can't plow, um, that the whole entire Betsaya may not be plowed? Okay, where do we get this from? And the, the Mishnah says it is because it is stated from the plowing and from the reaping you shall desist. Well, this is in Exodus 34, 21. Here's what the verse reads. It says, six days you may work, and on the seventh day you shall desist. From the plowing and from the reaping you shall desist. Although the first part of the verse clearly speaks of the Shabbat, the second part from the plowing could not refer to the Shabbat. Why would that be? Because it is not singling out a specific law not to do on Shabbos. It is talking about the Shabbos of years. And that is saying, this is a toldot, that you're not allowed to do on the on the shvias. Everybody knows you're not allowed to do work, any kind of work. Uh, plowing would be included, so it's not it's not singling out plowing on the Shabbat of the day of the week. So it's it's singling it out for the um, for the uh, for the shvias here. That's what they're saying, and the Mishnah continues and says. There is no need for the verse to say that the plowing and the reaping of the seventh year are forbidden. Rather, the verse must refer to the plowing on the eve of the seventh year that enters into the seventh year. In other words, plowing that benefits produce of the shvias. 
and to the reaping, says the Mishnah of the seventh year, that extends into the year following the seventh. So Rabbi Akiva is holding that the verse is referring not to the seventh year itself, but to the years before and after the seventh year. And this verse in the Torah is mentioning of plowing, prohibiting one to plow even during the sixth year before the Shvias, if the benefit of this kind of plowing is going to be realized during the Shvias year. That's the idea. So the verse, according to Rabbi Akiva, is mentioning the reaping that if the grain attained at least a third of its full growth during the seventh year, although it wasn't harvested until the eighth year, that it must be treated like the produce of the Shvias, because you were able to harvest it on the seventh year. And alternatively, the verse mentions reaping to prohibit any agricultural work like plowing, reaping, or hoeing in the eighth year that benefits grain that would be fit to be reaped in the seventh year. That's what Rabbi Akiva's point is. Now, there's a different interpretation of this verse. And the Mishnah says that Rabbi Yishmael says that the verse re refers to the Shabbat and it juxtaposes reaping to plowing in order to teach just as plowing is prohibited by this verse is strictly discretionary, so is the reaping prohibited by the verse discretionary. And this is teaching that the reaping of the barley for the Omer, which is an it's a positive commandment in the Torah, it's obligatory, is excluded from this prohibition. In other words, that you're allowed to reap barley for the Omer even on the Shabbos. That's the idea. And that plowing is going to be discretionary. What does that mean? Well, there is no instance in which the Torah obligates a person to perform an act of plowing. And therefore, when the verse prohibits plowing on the Shabbos, it is referring to a discretionary act. Now, the Mara Fulda says about this that the Omer is a mincha offering of the barley flour that is brought on the 16th of Nisan. That's going to be, by the way, the second day of Pesach. And Rabbi Yishmael is holding that it is a mitzvah to reap the barley on the 16th of Nisan for use of this offering. And even if ready-cut barley is available, new barley must be reaped for the sake of this offering. Now, what is the point of Rabbi Yishmael? What is he trying to say about this? Here's what he's saying. Rabbi Yishmael, as we know, is disputing Rabbi Akiva's interpretation, and he's holding that this entire verse is including the words from plowing and from reaping, you shall desist, and that's actually referring to the day of Shabbos, it's not referring to the year of Shabbos. It's talking about the day of Shabbos. And the purpose of this is to teach that although reaping is not allowed on Shabbos, the prohibition does not apply to reaping. That is an obligation, like the Omer. The Omer is a positive commandment in the Torah. That's an obligation. So by juxtaposing reaping to plowing, plowing, by the way, is never an obligation. The verse is teaching, according to Rabbi Ishmael, that only reaping prohibited on the Shabbos is reaping that's like plowing, and it's not an obligation. And that's excluded from the Shabbos prohibition of the reaping of barley for the Omer, which is an obligation that's a mitzvah. And therefore, if the 16th of Nisan falls on the Shabbos, the normal prohibition against reaping on Shabbos does not apply in the face of this mitzvah. And the barley that you have to have for the Omer is reaped even on the Shabbos. And Rabbi Yishmael is interpreting the verse in this way, and he has no scriptural source to forbid plowing in advance of the Shvias. Nevertheless, 
he agrees that Torah, the Torah prohibits this plowing, but we know that from a halaha lamosha klesina. So this is a really important uh, set of gemaras that's coming up, and we're going to get more depth and understanding about this very important law.